in an amazing thing, he, he tells us, first of all, I am going to forgive you. That's exactly what Jesus did by going to the cross. He was paying the price so God could forgive us. And we're going to get an amazing picture of forgiveness in that, in that verse. We're going to read it from Isaiah chapter 1. God says, though your sins are like scarlet. So you can think about your sins like red stains that would be all over your body. You're covered in red stains. God says, it will be as white as snow. How many of you have seen snow before? Right? We've all seen snow before. And it's, it's a pretty amazing thing when you're in the middle of winter. How does the grass usually look? Dirty and muddy, right? Everything looks kind of yucky outside. But then you get that first snow and it covers it all and it's white and perfect and you can't even see any of the dirt or mud. That's what God does with our sins. He covers them up in the perfect forgiveness of Jesus. They are as, as white as snow. It's an amazing thing. And we get to think about that all day today. We're going to talk later on in the sermon about how God wants us to, to live faithful lives and listen to our parents and help the people around us. That's really good. But we can't forget that foundation of what God does with our sins through Jesus. He, he forgives them. Though they are red stains that would cover us all over, through Jesus, we're, we're clean and we're as white as snow. Let's pray and, and thank God for that. Dear God, please help us to listen to you and your word, to listen to those who are in authority over us, to help the people around us, but most of all, to hear again those amazing words from you that you forgive all of our sins through your son, Jesus. Thank you for this awesome gift. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11, and then verses 16 through 18. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? <clears throat> I, have <more> <clears throat> <Sorry. clears throat> I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight, Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. This is God's word. That is the amazing gospel truth. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, sins are, are completely forgiven. Our, our New Testament reading from Romans chapter 12 teaches us what to do with that amazing gift of God's mercy and grace. We, we believe it, we trust it, but we don't take advantage of it. Now we build our lives on this and seek to conform our lives to the word and the will of God. God's word according to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. This is God's word.
We will continue with our song of the day, hymn 696 in the blue hymnals, Take My Life and Let It Be. The choir will sing the first verse. You're welcome to join in singing the remaining verses. The sermon this morning is based on the gospel reading recorded in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Please stand out of respect for the words and works of Jesus. Jesus says, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, 
to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See how I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him, who, from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside, into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Was that what you were expecting from the end of the parable? If you think about what we, we read in our Old Testament reading, Isaiah chapter 1, God takes sins, he covers them like snow covering the ground, forgives them. At the end of the parable, the servant is not forgiven. His sins are not covered like snow covering the ground. Instead, he is held accountable for his sin. He is judged for it. He is thrown outside where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. He is thrown into hell. Is that what you were expecting? This morning, we're, we're thinking about the expectations that we have. First of all, the, the expectation that, that we have from God or we have for God, rather. And it is true, like we read in Isaiah chapter 1, you can, you should, expect God's forgiveness. Because he promises it. Because Jesus earned, he bought your forgiveness on the cross. You can, you should, look to God day after day and expect mercy, grace, forgiveness. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. That is, that is very true. Looking to God and expecting that, we call that having faith. When you look to God, you expect good things, you expect mercy. That's what it means to have faith in God. But this morning, we're, we're not just talking about what we expect from God. We're, we're talking more about what God expects from us. That's really what the, the parable I just read is about. Jesus explaining to us the, the expectations God has for those who are forgiven. The expectations he has for those who have faith in him. God expects that those who have faith in him will be faithful and that they will produce fruit in keeping with the, the repentance and the forgiveness that, that God gives them. He expects his servants to remember that they are servants to, to work hard and, and to serve him. That's what, what God expects, and when those expectations are violated, there are, there are consequences to that, like there were with that servant, because that's what happens. That's what, that's what we all do when expectations are violated. I've, I've talked to some of you, and you've told me that there are restaurants that you will never go back to because one time they violated your expectations. Back in 1997, you went to Sonic, and they gave you the wrong order, 
So you will never go back to Sonic for the rest of your life. No more second chances for them. God is a God of second chances, third chances. He gives us opportunity after opportunity to serve him to produce fruit. But this parable is a reminder for us that those opportunities to produce fruit do not stretch on for eternity. There will come a day where we die or when Jesus returns, when we are called to account, and we are called to produce the fruit, to show the evidence of the fruit that we have produced from from the faith that God has given us. This is really part two of of last week. These, These two parables, if you were here last week, Jesus told the parable of the ten bridesmaids. And there he talked about the the five foolish and the five wise. The wise ones were those looking for the bridegroom to return. And that was a call for us to be vigilant, to be remembering that we're going to be called to account before God. So we're going to be vigilant looking for Jesus, but not doing nothing in the meantime. God calls on us to be diligent in the meantime. That's how I heard a much smarter person than me put it. God wants us to be vigilant. That was last week's parable. And then this week, to be diligent, to be actively working and serving him in the meantime, to be producing fruit and keeping with repentance. And to make this all simple for us, Jesus tells a story. So he tells us a parable about a man, a rich man, who goes on a journey. And as he goes on the journey, he calls his servants into them and trusts his property to them and gives them them different talents before he leaves. The word talent in Greek was just a fancy way of saying a big bag of gold. So you can imagine this man must have been a very rich man. He handed his servants a total of eight, eight bags of gold. One to five, one, two, one, one bag of gold. And right away, we're, we're learning. So we're, we're applying this parable to ourselves. We don't have to think too hard. Who do you think the master is? God, right? It's God. And who do you think the servants are? It's us. Right away, we're we're applying this to ourselves and realizing just how ridiculously generous our God is with us. We are his servants, and he entrusts to us, he gives to us so much in this life. Eight bags of gold to those servants. Just what a generous master. Sorry, I feel fine, but my throat does not feel that fine. Um, God entrusts to those servants, or the master entrusts to those servants, giant bags of gold and then just leaves. He wants them to be faithful with it, but he's not hovering over their shoulder. He's letting them enjoy it and and produce from it. Our God is is so generous with us. We can think about the the different talents, the the gifts that that God gives us. Maybe you've you've heard someone described before as, as talented. What comes to your mind if you think of someone who's talented? Maybe an athlete who's just so fast and can jump so high or a violinist who can play so beautifully. But that word talented, actually, in English, it comes from this parable. It comes from the Greek word, a giant bag of gold, because Christians thought about what God has given them and realized he's given us so much. Not just material blessings, but he's given us earthly talents, gifts, abilities, Some of you might remember the explanation to the first article of the Apostles' Creed from the Catechism. Remember this, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? Got a few confirmation class kids in here. I see you back there, Chase. He has created me and all that exists and given me my, remember this, body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my mind, and all my abilities. God has given us so much much in this world that we get to enjoy and we get to use to produce the fruit that he calls on us to produce. God has given us so much, and he hasn't given it to us all equally, right? One servant gets five, the other two, the other one. We know that we're not all the same in this world. God has wired us differently. Some of us are taller or shorter or faster or stronger or or quicker in our brain. We remember more things, but all of us have been given, given so much from God. Think about the servant who just got one talent. You think, oh, poor guy, just one talent. What's a talent? A giant bag of gold. (laughs) Just one giant bag of gold. That's what what he had received. What talents, what gifts has your God given you? 
They are many. The classic way to think about it is, is with the three T's. Maybe you've heard this before. You can think about the treasure God has given you, the, the monetary blessings. Maybe you, you worked for them. Maybe you inherited them. But ultimately, they come from God. God has given you, you treasure, and for so many of us, way more than enough to just keep ourselves alive. He's given us treasure. He's also given us talents, so we can think about the brains we have, the abilities that we've received from God or that we've worked hard to build in this life. God's given us those talents as well, and he's given us time. The, the hours that we have in this life are, are gifts of God. We receive them from him. We, we're living in this time of grace, this opportunity we have to serve God. He's given us treasure, time, and talents, and he's, he's poured them out on us in abundance just as a good gracious and, and generous master. You can think about the, the time, the treasure, the talents God has given you, each one of you, even if all you have seemingly is time. What a gift. You have time to praise God. You have time to pray to God on behalf of other people. You have amazing opportunities to, to serve the Lord in, in this life. And that, that helps us come to grips with the, the idea that we are servants. We, we receive these gifts from God and we're recognizing he is the one ultimately who is in charge of them. We are not the master ultimately of our time or our treasure or our talents. The Christian life is recognizing Jesus is, is our Lord. And we let him speak to us and call us to, to use those time, treasures, and talents faithfully in this life. We are not our own masters. Jesus is. And we recognize just how generous he is and how, how great it is to have an opportunity to serve him and to serve the people around us. The first servant realized that. The one who had received the five talents, he went out and, and right away, he put that money to work. So he got it. And then when the master returned after a long time, he couldn't wait to meet with the master. He went to him right away and, and brought him the, the five talents that he had earned. So if this servant were in church today, what would be his favorite part of the church service? The collection, the offering. He would not wait. Hurry up, pastor, get done with the sermon. I can't just, just stop talking. Let's, let's give back to God. He would not be able to wait for an opportunity to, to give back to the Lord for what, what he had been given. He, he got it. He had received generous gifts from a generous master. He was blessed to have an opportunity to work hard and, and serve him. The servant who had received two talents, same thing. He went right away, put those talents to work. After a long time, the master returned. He also could not wait to give back to the master what was his. And then the master said to him, if you caught this, the exact same thing he said to the first servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. That servant only produced, well, less than half of what the first servant produced, but he received the same commendation, the same blessing from his master, and we're learning from that too. God does call on us to, to work hard, and we should want to be productive in this life, serving the people around him, serving, serving the people around us, serving, serving our Lord, but it's not just about the quantity of fruit that we produce. What God is calling on us to, to do is to be faithful with what he has given us. And I know some of you would love to be way more generous with the people around you, but now you're, you're on a fixed income and you're not quite always able to do it. Some of you would love to have more time to volunteer more, and it's good to look at your schedule, try to free up more time, but, but right now you're, you're pretty booked. Some of you would love to have a family that you could serve and love, and right now you're not able to do that. But God isn't calling on you to be something that you're not. He's calling on you to recognize where he has put you, where he has planted you, and wherever that is, with whatever gifts he has given you, to seek to produce fruit. And as you do, by God's grace, as you serve the people around you and serve the Lord just by carrying out your daily responsibilities, God is so pleased. He's so happy. He's kind of like you grandparents when your grandkids give you a drawing that they've done for you in school, and maybe the drawing, objectively speaking, doesn't look very good. But what do you say? Wow! And you actually feel it. Like, what an awesome thing! What a gift! You're so talented! Eh, maybe. But, but you're just happy because your, 
your grandchild loved you and, and gave it to you. That is your God. As you humbly work where God has planted you with whatever gifts and abilities he's given you. So right now, I think about you, you younger kids, you students, you don't have lots of opportunities to travel around and own your own schedule and do all these things. What's, what's your daily calling? Listen to your parents, do your homework, love your siblings, right? That's, that's what God calls on you to do. As you do that faithfully, God is so pleased. He's so happy. He says, wow, what, what an amazing thing. I know some people watching this are, are homebound and they're, they're not really able to do anything at all out there in the world. But at home, they, they read their Bibles, they pray for you, they pray for this church, they pray for the people around them. God says the same thing. Wow, what an awesome gift. Good and faithful servant, come and enjoy your master's happiness. And it's just going to get even better. God said to the one with the ten talents, well done, I'm going to give you so much more. So thinking about the eternal glories that we will receive in, in heaven and eternity, we'll have opportunities still to somehow serve and work and produce things. I don't, I don't know exactly how, but Jesus says it's going to be awesome. You have received, to have 10 talents, I'm going to give you so much more. So heaven will be so much better than having 10 giant bags of gold. That's what God is going to give to his servants. It's an awesome gift, an awesome privilege to recognize we, we have these opportunities to serve God. And even the, the humble service that we offer God, it might not look that great. But through Jesus, we are his dearly loved children. So God is so pleased with whatever it is that we produce by faith motivates us and encourages us to, to keep serving God and to do the best we can with the, the time, the talents, the, the hours and days he's, he's given us. And it also highlights just how sad it is that the third servant didn't get it. He didn't get it at all. He got that talent from his master, a giant bag of gold, and, and all he did with it was take it and bury it in the ground. And then when the master returned, all he had was that same bag of gold, and he handed it back to his master. He was not faithful. He did not do what his master expected, put that bag of gold to work. And he had an ex excuse, at least he thought he did. You hear his excuse. He said, Master, I knew you, you are a hard man. You're, you're harvesting where you have not sown. You're, you're difficult. You're angry. That's his excuse. Does that track with you? Does that sound like the master that we read about? who is so generous, just giving his servants giant bags of gold, right? That, that doesn't sound like the master at all. He's, he's saying, master, you're, you're a taker, you're not a giver. That's, that's not true. And really, he's calling the master a liar. Remember, God gave talents to each of his, the, the master gave talents to each of his servants according to his ability. So he gave them things that they were able to, to use and to steward, to manage, so this, this servant did have the ability from his master to serve, to steward that one bag of gold. He could have put it to work, but he's calling his master a liar. No, you, you haven't given me what I can steward. I don't have opportunities to serve you. No, you are an evil man. And because of that, the, the servant received his punishment. He did not produce fruit like his master expected, and he was, he was cast outside. Is that ever a temptation for you and for me. I think it is to think of our God as a, a taker and not a giver. Ultimately, that's who he is, where he's put us in life. It's because he's, he's punishing us, not because he's giving us opportunities to serve him. We think of him as a, a taker and not a, and not a giver. And we make excuses sometimes when it's time to produce the fruit that God calls on us to produce. If it's generosity, well, we can come up with excuses just like that. Whoever knows if there's going to be enough to come around and if it's giving to church, well, we know churches who, who don't always faithfully manage their money. So I'm just going to kind of tune out whenever the Bible talks about being generous. When it's time to love your family or, or love your spouse, you can think of all the different ways that they don't appreciate you or they don't honor you and you, you have all these different ways that they've failed and they're, they're flawed. And you might use that as an excuse to not faithfully serve them and, and love them and honor them. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from the, the same place that that servant was, was thinking. He was not expecting his master to be kind and generous and loving. And, and it comes from the same place for us too. Why, why do we fail sometimes to be generous? Well, 
We don't believe God <laughs> when he tells us he will be generous with us and, and give us more than we need, give us our daily bread day after day. We struggle to believe God when he tells us that, that the faithful service he calls on us to produce, well, he will strengthen us for that. He will give us the, the power that we need to carry it out. He is watching. He will bless us ultimately, even if, if no one else sees. So we take those temptations and we, we compare them to, to the truth this morning and we hold up our real God. Do you believe Jesus is a giant jerk who is out to get you? Do you believe that? No. Do you believe Jesus is a taker and not a giver? Is that what you believe about Jesus? No. Why not? <laughs> because you've seen your Lord. You have seen your God. You have seen what he has done for you. Giving his only life for you. It was not cheap or easy for him to wipe away your sins and make them as white as snow. Right? What was the price? It was his holy, precious blood that your Savior paid for you. You've seen the generosity and the patience of Jesus in the gospel readings again and again and again. You've heard his promises that just like the birds have enough and the flowers of the field have enough, you, you will have enough too. You've seen the heart of your God. You know Jesus is not a liar when he tells you that he loves you, that he's going to care for you, that he is going to provide for you. You've seen that truth. And now in, in view of that mercy of God, right, like how Paul put it, in view of God's mercy, in view of his love for you, you view your life as a, as a living sacrifice. And you view your moments and your days as opportunities to, to give God praise. You compare your, your life to the word of God and the will of God. You don't conform to this world. This world will tell you, use whatever you have to make yourself feel better all the time. That's your highest good. You know better. You know it's better to give than it is to receive. You know it's better to, to serve your, your God. He is ultimately the one in charge. You don't conform to the ways of this world. You view your life as, as a living sacrifice now, now to God. And in an amazing gift, you know what you can expect. As you do that, as you serve and honor your God as, as humbly as you are able, even as you stumble, ask God for forgiveness, stand back up, try again day after day after day, you know what you can expect from God. Forgiveness, you can expect strength, you can expect mercy that will never run out and grace upon grace, you can even expect to hear this one day. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. God grant it. Amen. Please stand. We will confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed that are printed on page 9. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Jay and Donita and, and Eric, you're welcome to come up to the front.
We have the privilege of welcoming into our church family officially this morning um, Eric Percy and Jay and Donita Stanley. It's a privilege to be with you and to be official partners in, in gospel ministry here at Shepherd of the Hills along with you. Dear members of Shepherd of the Hills, Eric, Jay, and Donita, having been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God, desire to become members of this congregation. Brothers and sister in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him on earth. You have come before this Christian congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. Do you believe that the teachings of the Lutheran Church, as you have learned them here and from Luther's small catechism, are faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, answer, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, be diligent in the use of God's Word and sacraments, and lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. Having heard your promises, we, the members of Shepherd of the Hills, receive you in fellowship and love and invite you to share in our worship and mission. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome. Let's welcome them. I won't forget this time after that sermon. We'll continue now by, by gathering the offering. We will continue with the prayer of the church printed on page 10. We'll give God thanks, especially this morning, on behalf of Matthew Zastro. He's happy to report that his surgery went well and his, he's already begun his recovery. So we'll give God thanks for that and, and ask, God for, ask for God's continued blessing and strength for, for Matthew. Let's pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord for the well-being of all people everywhere that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, we thank you for the special mercy and grace you've shown Matthew, granting him a successful surgery. We thank you for those who care for him and the diligence that they've shown. We ask that for continued strength for Matthew over the coming days and weeks as he recovers and returns to strength. We know he would love to get back to, to serving you as he, as he had been. Continue to give him strength and, and peace day after day. Hear us also, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions.
Help us to run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful to your word that we may receive the crown of life. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue with um, Psalm 128. You may follow the directions as the choir leads us in the the first refrain and, and by singing the verses. Everyone ought to examine their hearts before partaking of the Lord's Supper.